So after looking at Cuba last week, it's only right that the next island, Caribbean island, we look at is Puerto Rico. Now, I'll be honest, my knowledge was pretty much non-existent about Puerto Rico. Obviously, we know a, a couple of the brands. It is really a story of two brands. But I'm going to, I have learned a bit. I have researched a bit. So let's shallow dive into Puerto Rico. Rum. Now, what I do essentially say is a tale of two brands, two distilleries from Puerto Rico. It is important to know that there are actually another three. Uh, but it's not probably until you go really down your rum journey and maybe seek out other rum brands, other distilleries, that you would probably come across these. So we've got Barrelito, we've got San Juan, which actually does uh, apparently produce cane juice rum, uh, which is very different to stereotypical molasses based rums on Puerto Rico and we have actually got Club Caribe as well. So I think when we when we talk about Puerto Rican rums it is safe to acknowledge that we are talking about two of the world's biggest players when it comes to rum on a, on a worldwide market and uh, obviously Bacardi is actually the second biggest I think it still is officially the second biggest uh, distillery worldwide and second after Tandawai uh, from the Philippines over in Asia uh, but We've also got um, Serranos Don Q that kind of do make up quite a healthy amount of global rum as well. Now, the big thing that I can take from reading between the lines here, the, the thing that's massively helped Puerto Rico when it comes to rum is the fact that they are under US control. Okay, so when it comes to Cuba, for example, we all kind of know that, you know, Cuban rum isn't allowed into the US and they prohibit sales and all that. The big thing with Puerto Rican rum, because it's under US control, it means they don't suffer the same as any other brand from outside the US when it comes to US import tax. So it's dirt cheap for them to sell their rum to the US mainland, which is one of the biggest uh, global markets for rum. Now, Puerto Rican rum has been around quite a long time. I've seen history. It's kind of, I, I'm not saying it's a relevant history, but it's kind of history that isn't really relevant to what I would tell you in these sort of video, uh, videos. But I can tell you that Puerto Rican rum has been around since the 1800s, 1900s. It kind of started to explode a little bit uh, at the early stages of prohibition because from, re from what I can read, is actually, you know, whiskey was the big thing that was uh, prohibited, but rum was still allowed for the first couple of years of prohibition. So that's where that came in. However, all alcohol kind of got prohibited for a time. Uh, so, you know, they kind of suffered a little bit, but the big explosion for Puerto Rican came, came because of World War II. Now, during that time, uh, the US government basically said whiskey production halted because they wanted the grain to be used for other things, vital supplies when it came to the war, your bread and all that sort of stuff. They didn't want to waste grain on whiskey. So whiskey was just not made at all for a period of time during World War II. However, obviously people still wanted their booze, still wanted their spirits, and obviously there was an abundance of sugar cane and Puerto Rico being, a U, being under US control, you can imagine rum was the next big thing. So Puerto Rican rum simply exploded during World War II out in the US. Now with all worldwide trends, no matter what it is, even to this day, take the gin, you know, the, the, the recent gin boom, there's peaks and troughs. So obviously, uh, after World War II finished, obviously when whiskey production started up again, you know, that saw a little bit of a decline of rum because everyone wanted whiskey. Now, it wasn't solely down to whiskey that Puerto Rican rum took a hit. It was sugar cane as well. The amount of sugar cane they needed, they just didn't have the resources back then. They didn't have the abundance of sugar cane. So the, the amount that they needed decreased, which meant they had to import more sugar cane from neighboring islands and other parts around the world. So obviously the costs of production of rum then went up. So whiskey became the obvious choice. Now I do have a little fun fact that I kind of sort of semi knew about before researching this. When Seagram's, uh, Puerto Rico distillers, were, were on the island, uh, Seagram's actually produced, it's where uh, the bulk of Captain Morgan's rum was produced. It was produced in Puerto Rico. However, when Sir Alice bought Puerto Rico Distillery, uh, which kind of is, as I say, was the home of Seagram's. Don't forget, Seagram's was kind of, a, I think it's right in calling it this, but like a, I can't even say the word, subsidiary of Diageo. Diageo being the owner, the parent brand of um, Captain Morgan's and Gordon's and Smirnoff and all that sort of stuff. But Diageo very quickly pulled out 
of the deal. So they took their production elsewhere and they took their production to uh, an island called St. Croix, uh, which again is part of the US of Virgin Islands. Now, however, even though we saw a decline of Puerto Rican rum, sales volumes were kind of on the whole dipping, Bacardi actually went from strength to strength. During that time, they just grew and grew and grew. And let's be honest, they are still flipping growing today because as I say, they are the number two worldwide when it comes to rum. And I've written a couple of, uh, a little bit of fat bombs before we go into sort of Bacardi and stuff like, and, and Sorales in there. I'm not gonna talk about the kind of how Bacardi came from uh, Cuba to Puerto Rico. There is, if I can remember watching this back, there is an epic kind of, I think it's six part podcast uh, that tells the story of uh, the, the whole Facundo family and Bacardi and how Castro got involved. It is brilliant. So I'll try and link that podcast below so you can go and learn about that. I can't even do it justice compared to that. But it's important to note Bacardi obviously did come from to Puerto Rico from Cuba. But let's talk about this distillery for a minute and Bacardi as uh, as a brand. They use continuous stills, which is the same as Sorales, we'll come on to that in a minute, molasses-based rums, uh, and they can produce 45 million liters of rum a year. I'll say that again, 45 million liters of rum a year. Now with that in mind, it is <laughs> safe to say that Bacardi did outgrow Puerto Rico. You know, they just, there wasn't the volume, there wasn't the area for them to kind of operate. So Bacardi have actually got three, um, I think I think it's three distilleries. It's definitely three places around the world. So we've obviously got the main kind of distillery focus in Puerto Rico. We have got their head office, uh, which is now in Bermuda, but they also do distill Bacardi out in India. Now, just to break that sort of 45 million liters down e even more, just to make this more sort I mean, that is a huge number in itself, but just to make this more relatable, we are talking, because of their continuous stills, which just go, it's very different method of even a column still, you know, they are column stills, but they're continuous column stills, which means there isn't a start and an end point. It's just ongoing, if you like. But don't don't think that the still, don't think the continuous stilling can't give you different types of rums, because it can, which we'll come on to with Sorales in a second. Uh, but it's, to break this down, we are talking uh, 100,000 litres of rum a day, which basically produces 220 million bottles of Bacardi a year. 220 million bottles. That's a lot of rum. Now, while researching Puerto Rico, I couldn't find anything about GI, geographical India uh, indicator or rules and uh, which, you know, which they have to abide by. But there are a couple of things that both kind of distilleries do with their uh, with their distilling. So we, we'll talk about fermentation times for a second. I'd like to sort of drop this in as well. Bacardi re renowned for having a very short fermentation time. You're talking up to 24 hours. That's compared to say like Jamaica and Barbados, which could be anywhere from three days to three weeks uh, from fermenting their molasses and all that. So it was a very short fermentation time. When you Again, you can argue that the longer the fermentation, the, lo the more flavors come out of those molasses when it comes to the distilling. But every kind of distillery has their different way of doing things. Because as, as you will have heard in, in the Cuban video, for instance, but, both, uh, both distilleries do kind of operate sort of very similar to the Cuban style when you have your Aguardiente, which is your better quality rum, and your Distillado, or Redistillado, if you like, uh, which is your sort of less quality. Now, the Aguardiente kind of gets distilled to roughly, give or take, 75% ABV. So that is your good quality stuff. When they, when you hear people talking about, oh, it's all, it's all column stilled and it's distilled to 90, 92, 93% ABV, don't forget, you know, a lot of distilleries, even though they have column stills, can bring that ABV down to give you a lot more flavor. So the Guadiente level uh, of rum with Bacardi is distilled to 75% uh, ABV, and it's then it's your distillado, your red distillado, uh, that is then uh, kind of distilled up to sort of mid 90s. But again, it comes down to the, the different blend, and it's what the maestros, the different blends of Aguardiente to Destilado that makes the different quality rum. So when we move on to Sorales, their big brand, they do produce a hell of a lot of rum in their own right as well, but their big brand is Don Q, Don Coyote, that's what it's named after. We've got various different rums in the range. 
In, when it comes to production levels, they aren't that far behind Bacardi. We're talking, we're talking roughly, officially from what I've seen, 40 million litres uh, a year compared to 45. So they're not that far behind. And even though I can't personally confirm this, I have seen evidence of this two or three different reports to say that actually uh, Sorales rum, Donkey rum, is actually the biggest selling rum in Puerto Rico. It's not Bacardi, it's actually Donkey or, Sor or rums from Sorales. But here is the important thing to note here because while Bacardi just distill Bacardi rum, they do not, as far as I'm aware, they do not distill any other rum and sell off to any other independent bottle or anything like that. What they produce is very much down for them. It is very, very different with Sir Alice because obviously um, their rum, their, their genetic makeup, or their, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, 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 the different amounts of rum that they distill, 20% of that goes towards their brands. 80% of the rum they make actually gets sold off to other brands, independent bottlers, blenders to mix in with other rums. When you see rums in the UK, especially that have got Caribbean rum on it, this is where all these brands, all these distilleries come into play. Because while they don't say, you know, this is rum from Sorales or this is rum from Guyana or, or DDL or anything like that, when it's um, Caribbean rum, you've got all these distilleries making rums that are sold off. So 80% of that 40 million litres that they make or produce a year gets sold off to independent bottlers, independent uh, blenders. But I love this little fact that I found when I was researching this. Now, bear in mind, I've been to a few UK distillers now and we've seen, uh, I've, I've kind of seen them have like an IBC container distilled, which is like a plastic thousand litres, sometimes smaller, you can get 600 litre IBCs. I'm, I'm very, I presume you get smaller, even smaller IBCs, but typically we're talking thousand litre IBC containers, which will hold, you know, a thousand litres of molasses. So that's, you know, about that big sort of thing, about that square molasses, one of those will last a, a UK British uh, distiller quite a long while. Get this for a fun fact. I'll have to read this because I've forgotten it already. So, Sorales hold 9 million litres of molasses on site. 9 million litres on site just to keep them going. And get this, they've got another 2 million litres in reserve at the local port just in case they get, just in case they run out. That is insane. Now just to talk about fermentation times and distilling compared to Bacardi, the fermentation time of the Don Q range, at least what I can find, is up to 48 hours. It's two days. So we're going for a day longer than what Bacardi would do. Uh, but we're going for their, so that's for their light rums. But for, so as I say, you know, just because they are con stills and even continuous stills, doesn't mean to say they can only make sort of light bodied rums. They can make heavy bodied rums as well, medium bodied rums out of column stills. Of course they can. Uh, so but the um, the fermentation, fermentation time is two days for their sort of light bodied rums, but the heavier body rums can go anything from two and a half days up to 12 days. All right, so that, you know, depending on the rums they make, that 12 day ferments, you know, is a very different to sort of your stereotypical clean, crisp kind of column still rum. Now the only thing really to wrap up with talking about aging, they do, both places do have uh, massive on-site aging warehouses. Um, we're talking at most barrels, uh, kind of ex-bourbon barrels, you know, but Donk, you definitely go down the route of different barrels and experimentations, stuff like that. So they've got plenty of aging, as I say, American white oak ex-bourbon barrels are the predominant here. But there's a fun fact I found from, and I have kind of seen this, but never kind of understood it until I went down this. Don Q do have a very small um, kind of Solera system going on. Now, that's not to say their rums are Solera aged, but what I do like about this, and say they've got a small, very small contained Solera sort of thing. So what they do is uh, rums up to four years old, or well, as soon as rums, uh, some rums that have hit four years old go into the t top of the Solera, 
And by the time it's only three sort of tiered solera, so top getting the top then gets filtered into the middle, the middle gets filled into the bottom, and you take from the bottom. The bottom, you know, the very first was started in like the, the sort of 50s or 60s. So there are some rums in there that have been sitting there for 50, 60 years, say, in the bottom solera when it comes there. Now, what they do with that, they actually add a little bit of that to certain projects to kind of add little flavors. And the best line I saw to kind of describe that, imagine adding a dash of Angostura bitters to a cocktail to give it seasoning. That's exactly what they do with that Solera. They just add a small, minute amount of that Solera aged to certain rums, bearing in mind, you know, that's it's, it's minimum of four years old that's gone into the top. And it's years and years and years and years before they take, you know, before that even gets to the bottom. So you've got healthy ages in the bottom of this layer that you're ready to take. But they take a little bit of that just to add different seasoning, different flavor profiles to create different rums.